Welcome to the Dear Applicants podcast, where we dive into practical tips, insightful interviews, and explore personal stories that will hopefully inspire and motivate you to pursue your dreams and achieve your university admission goals. Hello, students and parents, and welcome to another episode of Dear Applicants. I'm your host, Jonathan, and with me with me today is Visakhan, a graduate of Raffles Institution and who currently holds offers from Oxford, LSE, and KCL. Uh, thank you for joining us today. How are you? Thanks, Jonathan. Really nice having you here, and my pleasure. Uh, so, you want to introduce yourself a little bit? Absolutely. So, I'm Visakhan. I'm 18-year-old, uh, just graduated from RI. I'm passionate about math, econs, financial literacy, scouting, and uh, I did physics, math, further math in, in school. Uh, I was a lot into math Olympiad, into financial literacy and all that kind of stuff. So yeah, that's mainly about me. Okay, cool. So a lot of stuff to jump into over there. I guess obviously as, as we've been through already, the reason why we brought you on this show is, is of course you've you've, you've, you've you know, applied and got accepted to Oxford as well as a bunch of other schools in the UK. Uh, but you also have a really interesting profile. You're up to quite a bit uh, in your secondary school and, and JC days. And I want to get into all of that. But I think a great starting point would be your age two, right? You said you had done PFME. So that further math over there is something that's quite interesting. And you had told me before we started rolling that it, it replaced chemistry. Uh, what was the deal with further math? Exactly. So uh, for the maps, a pretty new kind of thing. It was in the syllabus for a very long time, and then it was taken out in the 2000s and came back in 2017. Uh, it kind of replaces chemistry for me. I think uh, I was pretty sure that I was going to do a career in the quantitative sciences, wanted to do tertiary education in that. So I kind of, you know, had the opportunity to take further math because that helped me narrow down my choices in future. So that's why I took that. Uh, actually, it's a very small cohort, only 20 of us in, in only one class of 20 students in the entire school. Okay. So yeah, that's for the math. Uh, it's pretty, pretty rigorous. Uh, almost it feels like one and a half subjects actually though, because it kind of replaces chemistry. So instead of studying chemistry and mathematics, you kind of study mathematics and a bit more mathematics. So it's like a 1A, 1B kind of exactly, thing. Exactly, 1A, 1B kind of thing. And why further math instead of H3 math? Because that's a right. more, I'd say, common combination that we've seen. Exactly. So for me, I think uh, I wanted to pursue H3 game theory. So I kind of had the idea of, you know, trying a new kind of H3. So my options going into JC1 or JC2 was H3 economics and H3 game theory. Uh, I kind of felt that the content in history mathematics was a bit uh, something that I can study on my own more than the ones that game theory and economics provided because there was more opportunity for discourse, more opportunity for debate. So that was the kind of uh, reasoning behind me pursuing H2 mathematics for the mathematics. I guess it would have been a little bit overkill having three math cl uh, math modules or exactly. math courses out of five. Uh, tell us a little bit about game theory. So what, what did you have to do with their final project? Was it more, uh, you know, problem solving oriented? What, what, what did that, what did that class look like? Absolutely. So I think just a brief introduction about game theory, it's uh, analyzing the strategic in interaction between two players or two uh, parties. So in game theory, uh, this course was held at SMU, Singapore Management University. So every Friday from three to six, we would go down to, you know, Dobie Gott, uh, sit in and listen to our professor talking about game theory. So it, he would just do a slideshow and then we would have a lot of, of course, it's game theory. So we would play a lot of games, interactive games, uh, things like, you know, Split or Steel, just a famous game. You can Google that up. So... You know, we would try to understand what drives the behaviors and mindsets behind choices that one makes at a very personal level, all the way up to what governments do. Uh, if the Cold War is going on between US and Russia, then what kind of choices are they going to make? What kind of, you know, uh, what kind of strategies are they employing? So these kind of things are what we analyze in game theory. And so it was a four month course. So it was from the January of my uh, second year in JC up till April. And that four month course ended in a final exam, three hour exam, pen and paper, traditional stuff, just three questions. And we had to go through a lot of mathematical 
prove related, proving related questions and trying to justify why we are gonna employ this strategy over that strategy. So all in all, I think the benefits and costs, the benefits obviously outweigh the costs of taking game theory. We, you know, the course was short. So we ended our A we ended one entire A level subject in just four months. Mm. So we took the final exam in April instead of November for all the other subjects. So that was I guess that worked out, right? The yeah. advantage in some sense. Yeah, so less to less to crunch at the back end of the A levels, but also more to do at the front end of the that hectic year. Right, but I mean a real time crunch, right, at the end of the year, because Absolutely. then you have your your college applications as yeah. well. Yeah. So. Um, and so it, you know, very clearly, it's very clear to me, and of course we'll get to your extracurriculars in just a bit. But even academically, that you were very much aligned with that long term goal of quantitative sciences. So where did that come from? Have you just always been a STEM inclined student, perhaps, or you know, I guess. Quantitative science of itself is a very particular field. You said something you may be interested in going into is finance. Uh, I guess, where did that idea come from? Is it something that you researched, read about? If you, uh, you know, gained from conversations with other people, seniors perhaps, or, you know, uh, adults that you've been around? Absolutely. So I think the idea of doing quantitative sciences or anything related to finance, it kind of came from a very young age. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, inclination was obviously one one reason behind that uh, inclination towards numbers. Just trying to you know look at numbers and seeing statistics in the world excited me at a very young. I age. envy you. Math has never been my strong suit. <laughs> yeah, so yeah, it has been. You know, it's always a challenge analyzing them, but luckily I kind of enjoyed the process. So it, it's great that it came, and then we you know took that a little bit further by you know spending a bit of time outside school in mm -hmm. primary school, you know, exploring what's math Olympiad, exploring how, you know, these kind of uh, real world mathematical concepts are applied. So that kind of interest, you know, at P6, when I finished my PSLE and went on to secondary school, then I was thinking, oh, maybe now is the right time to think about like career and what I want to do in the future. Well, I'm still absolutely undecided now, but what I can say is that it has got to do something with numbers. And the reason behind that was probably, you know, all the math Olympiad that I'd done, all the all the extra lessons and all the videos and just the general enjoyment that I got from, you know, looking at numbers and statistics. And when, when you thought about applying to, to university, uh, what was the tipping point between choosing economics or economics and management on one hand uh, and doing math on the other? Absolutely. So for the viewers, I think uh, the course that I applied to at Oxford was economics and management. So that's an entirely different course from mathematics. Mm -hmm. And for me, I think at that stage, at that very, you know, at that JC2 18 year old stage, the consideration was probably looking at, you know, thinking about things on a wider scale and just appreciating, you know, what drives our economy, what drives, you know, people on a larger scale. So at that point I started to understand you know, quantitative things were probably something that I could learn on myself. Uh, but at places like Oxford or LSE, any of these universities, you know, the the great opportunity that you're going to get is probably through discourse with tutors and learning from them. And that probably would be best if you, you could maximize your learning if you did a more qualitative subject. So that was one key reason as to why I chose economics. And economics in itself is, uh, you know, like quantitative, quantitative social sciences, you could say to some extent. So I think that's pretty much exactly what it yeah. is. Right? Yeah. So I think, yeah, that's why I, I ended up choosing that course. Okay. And you mentioned the sort of discourse, right? That drive is learning at Oxford. Is that something that you were attracted to? Uh, I know that, I guess are you more, you're more used to the lecture style of, of learning, right? That's far. Well. Yeah. So in Singapore, obviously going through the GCA levels and everything is, you know, kind of top down, lecture driven, you know, you watch pre-recorded videos sometimes. Uh, so for the more interactive style, I guess I it's think, a bit of a silly question because yeah. it's attractive in and of itself, but, but anyway. Yeah. So I think for economics, uh, in, in JC, that was probably my tipping point. I had a teacher who really inspired me to, you know, go beyond the classroom and mm -hmm. things like that. 
And what you know interested me was probably what probably got me excited about the Socratic style was case study. It takes up forty percent of your economics grade in school, but it gives you a really, really real life context and asks you to apply that to the very pragmatic or very you know like rote style of learning. So in essence, I got both the rote style of learning and also the the very discourse driven kind of learning. And then it was then that I saw the merits of you know started leaning yeah, more in that direction. Yeah, in that direction. So you must be quite looking forward, right? To Absolutely. to wherever I mean wherever it is you end up, you end up going. I think it must be quite nice to get a, a taste of or a different style Absolutely. of learning. Did, were you considering applying to Singapore? Yeah, so I I did consider applying to Singapore, but uh, since the Oxford offer was before the Singapore application cycle, I think I had the luxury of. Not okay, applying. I've heard from the UK already, yeah. and so so you knew that as long as you got in yeah. to one of your say target universities Absolutely. in the US or the UK, you would have gone. Yeah. Okay, um, and you you earlier you said something about you know okay I'm probably going to do economics and management because the math side of things I can always do myself, yeah. and it's true to say that when you were in JC and, and perhaps even secondary school, you were doing a lot of exploration in the field of mathematics by yourself anyways. Do you, do you want to walk us through some of those activities? Sure. So I think uh, the most mathematical related activity was Math Olympiad. Right. How many of those did you participate in? Well, if I were to give you a count, it would be definitely in the double digits. So also oh, like multiple every year. Yeah, multiple, at least two or three every year. Was it something year. your parents made you go for? In the- well, <laughs> I mean, the initial push is obviously parents and not teachers. But I think after P4, P5, I started concentrating on the PSLE. Right. So I had like a couple of years hiatus of not doing any sort of Olympiads. And then when I went to secondary school and it was about what am I going to do outside the curriculum? And I think Olympiads was a very natural answer. I think uh, in secondary school, I started doing the AMC, the American Mathematics Competition. Mm. And that was the tipping point where it really got me to think about problems on a totally different scale as to what I'd ex- as to what I had been exposed to in primary school. And then I started learning on my own, doing all sorts of, uh, you know, looking through videos on YouTube. There's this website called Art of Problem Solving. There's reading through forums, chats, discussions, talking to my teacher. So... At some point in time, that interest came naturally, and it seemed pretty, you know, uh, it seemed like it all flowed in the end. And I think the progression was up till Sec four. I I didn't really a- achieve a lot of results. Actually, another important thing I wanted to share was I'm not a very, I'm not a very traditionally talented person. What does that mean in in math Olympiad? So, in math Olympiad, you have two types of people. One the genius who gets everything in the first try and the other is the guy who gets sick of it in in like five minutes and i was neither of those two categories i was someone who was excited by it but also you know couldn't immediately put pen to paper and see oh this is the solution mm-hmm. that's how i'm going to do the question so i wasn't i wasn't gifted with that ability but i did have the will and the interest to carry me through so I kind of persevered my way through a bit of sec one to sec four. My goal was to achieve gold in the SMO. So I think in sec two, I got silver. It's a Singapore math Olympiad. Yeah, Singapore math Olympiad. I got silver. Uh, I think sec three again, I got silver. And it was, you know, getting like, when am I going to make that final push to gold? Because gold is obviously like the highest achievement that you can get. And I think at that point, I... Somehow in Sec four, it started clicking. I I did manage to pursue it. I got some time because in uh, my Sec four exams ended a bit earlier in July or August probably. So I got some time to spend on Math Olympiad. I you know I did a final push and ultimately got it got gold on the SMO in Sec four. And then after that, it was you know now I've reached this and what next, right? So time to retire. Uh, time to retire is you know that's an obvious question obvious answer but at that point it was like oh my god I spent like 20 hours each week or 10 hours each week at least and what am I going to do with all this right right what is it just going to go to waste when I start studying for my A-levels when it's just you know hardcore 
school level math, school level economics. So I think the natural answer was to, you know, do some tuition, provide some tuition classes. So I, I did teach a few students for a couple of years. Was that within our right or, so. or were the students that you knew from outside? Uh, some of them, my neighbors, some okay. of them, my friends, my juniors from RI also, then I, you know, I started, you know, enjoying the process of teaching. But at one point, probably it was like the end of JC1, I started realizing that uh, probably tutoring isn't my cup of tea. <laughs> if I want to give back to the math Olympiad community. At what point did you start realizing that it wasn't your cup of tea? I think it was when I was probably getting, uh, you know, I was just thinking, you know, is this the right thing to do? Mm. Because uh, when you're tutoring, you spend two hours teaching and then you spend like another hour before it preparing the materials, another hour preparing what you're going to teach. And at that point of time in JC1, the hectic period, is this the best use of my time? So that's the question. And were my students really, really, really benefiting from it? Yeah, obviously they had that great jump from, let's say, bronze to silver. But it was nothing like I wasn't making them go to the International Math Olympiad or anything. So then I thought about it and probably realized, oh, I'm not the best at this. So what else can I do, right? So then I realized that resources in the Math Olympiad community was something that was lacking a lot. Uh, I personally, you know, why we students had to spend a lot of time was because there was no books or no, you know, guide that really held your hand and brought you from step one to step 20 of, you know, getting gold or whatever. And so my decision was to write a book. Uh, and I, I started in <coughs> the end of JC1, in end of 2021, and then spent almost a year writing a book, uh, you know, tinkering with this and that, asking mentors, asking my teacher, how does this sound? Is this too silly to include in a book? Uh, and ended up publishing it on Amazon in October 2022, which was last year. And how is it doing? I think it's got about 140 sales. Oh, wow. So okay. it's done beyond my expectations. But yeah, hopefully we keep going. And I'm looking to see what's my next edition or what's my next endeavor on that front. Before we continue, I would like to take a quick break to remind you to subscribe to our podcast and leave us a review on your favorite platform. Your feedback helps us improve and to reach a wider audience to provide further insight into this arduous journey. Also, if you have any questions or suggestions for future episodes, feel free to email us at our email linked in the description below. We'd love to hear from you. So it's really interesting that you've, you know, like you pointed out, you've spent so many years training for, these, for this math Olympiad. You spent about 10 to 20 hours a, a week, uh, participated in double jersey things. You've, you've reached the top and then gone, okay, now what? And decided, okay, the, you know, the other people that are going to walk the same path that I did, how do I make that easier and for them? Uh, and you go so far as to create this, I don't want to say blueprint, but sort of structures and frameworks yeah. of how you should be preparing and how you should study to get there, um, which is really cool, right? Uh, if I was to ask, when you were preparing for the Olympiads, how much do you felt you explored and learned in that regard? Was it more, okay, I have to do ABC and just keep doing it until I'm familiar with this? Or were you genuinely exploring uncharted waters for a while in pursuit of, you know, making sure that you knew everything Absolutely. or everything you needed to know? Yeah, I think it's more of the latter where okay. you had to go through a bit of uncharted waters. Uh, there were programs in school, tuitions and all that kind of stuff, but there wasn't anything structured for me to do on my own if I wanted to. And for that, I think there are a lot of resources on Amazon, but mm -hmm. uh, those were not really at the standard that we were looking at. Either they are too hard or either too easy. So that was something that was my primary concern. And yeah, that's why I ended up writing the book, trying to pitch it at a level that someone who is interested in mathematics could understand but you don't necessarily have to be genuinely talented. Okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Fair enough. And so moving on from Math Olympiads, I know that you've been involved in a ton of finance or investment and investment oriented activities. Uh, okay. Was that purely out of interest? Uh, did, did people help you find these projects? Was it more you Googling uh, and then figuring out, okay, this is something that I can do. You know, that's something else I can explore. Yeah. So I think, yeah, that's a natural cause of discussion. Apart from mathematics, finance is 
the second biggest. And thing I mean, of there. course, there was the Stanford Math Camp, right? Which yeah. was, which was finance oriented as well. So there was an overlap. Yeah, there was an overlap there. And I think, as for finance, I think my main interest, obviously, for finance, the mathematic fundamentals have to be there before you get to finance. But for especially finance, if you want to do the quant stuff. Yeah, the quant stuff. Oh my, <laughs> yeah. But for finance, I think my interest came in about 2020 when COVID struck and everyone was at home, working from home, studying from home, home-based learning. And that was when I kind of started thinking about income inequality in Singapore. It's not a much, it wasn't a much addressed issue in the uh, 2010s in that decade. Mm -hmm. I think it's come to the light of ministers and so on now. But what happened was COVID-19 kind of exacerbated income inequality. A lot of people lost their jobs while the rich were still getting richer. And that seemed pretty stark to me because, you know, Singapore, everyone is so well educated. Everyone is so well, you know, well read and everyone knows current affairs, all the kind of stuff that you want to see in people who are having successful careers. But ultimately it seemed like there was something missing seem like uh, probably there is some sort of inequality where some people have access to great jobs and mm -hmm. others are struggling to make ends meet. And sometimes it goes under the radar also for Singapore. So my motivation, I mean, what can I do as a 16 year old, right? So my goal was to kind of read up on that. So finance, investment. Yeah, another thing was obviously there was a lot of financial scams at that time, COVID-19 struck a lot of people started calling, spam calling. And, you know, so many elderly youth, everyone was getting scammed of their money. And so at that point of time, I was thinking, I should get more knowledgeable about this before I want to do any sort of impact. So your interest in income inequality is less at a sort of state policy level, but more from a personal finance sort of point of view. So yeah. financial literacy yeah. and education of people. Okay, that's interesting. Yeah. So, yeah, so moving on, I think, the CFA Investment Foundations program was something that I was interested about. Uh, it's kind of like a self-study course from like 60 all the way until 90 hours. Then we have to do a test and you have to pass that. It's pretty doable if you put the heart to it. And so I did that, understood what the financial world was about, what investments are, uh, what do financial professionals do, and most importantly, what personal finance is. How do you budget? How do you save? And it struck me there that at, at the age of 16, what I wasn't going to be able to do was go and knock on the door of ministers and say, hey, you should be doing this or that on, in terms of economic policy. But rather, I, was, I, had, I felt like I had an obligation to you know, carry on this personal finance skills and give that to youth. Mm. Uh, in Singapore, obviously, we have a decent amount of rich people. And I saw a lot of students, you know, and also youth in Singapore, you know, there's less regard to money, uh, more like, you know, I just had bubble tea. Now let's have ice cream, right? There's no, this, there's no uh, shortage of money. And so accordingly, there's no, you know, that there's not that much respect for money as well. So I thought that I could, you know, kind of teach these skills to these youths as well as underprivileged youth who are on the other side of it, who were, you know, not getting that much allowance from their parents and uh, struggling to make ends meet. So what I did was I called out my friend in, in school who was also particularly invest interested about, you know, investing finance. And we thought about what about, you know, doing a nonprofit, right? What, what if we mm -hmm. can just teach youths just like us about personal finance skills? And I think that was a pretty interesting idea. We didn't know how it would go then. We were thinking maybe, oh, we would teach our juniors or our school just RI and then keep it there. But what happened was much bigger. And uh, fortunately, we were able to go to many schools in the neighborhood, many schools in the country. When you say we, was it just your friend and you or was it an entire organization? Yeah, that so you it started with just my friend and mm -hmm. I, but uh, we are now a 20-man team. We have done a presentation in India for about 50 to 60 underprivileged youth and also in another one planned in Vietnam. Okay. Uh, coming soon. And how are you finding these partners? 
So I think we ha- we do have a pretty good contact network within our school, and we also got a grant from National Youth Council. Okay. Young Change Makers Grant, two thousand five hundred dollars. So through that, we got access to a few connections. We understood who uh, really needed these kind of skills, whether it was in Singapore or beyond. And we got them to join, and yeah, so that's so the twenty issue. members are all made up of of RI students. Uh, yeah, okay. as of now. And so, so I guess my next question would be: if it's if it's affiliated with a school, um, what is your role going to be like? Given that it's your baby, right, quote yeah. unquote, or, or maybe you share uh, parenting duties with with this friend of yours. I'm, I'm assuming you guys are sort of co heads. Yeah, co founders. Uh, what happens? Now that you've graduated, you're going to be heading off to university. Uh, what happens to that organization? Do you pass it down to a junior or does it live on sort of outside of just RI? Yeah, so on that note, I think uh, I think the school was a, setting, a stepping board oh, yeah. for us and it was a great platform. The teachers encouraged us a lot, mm-hmm. gave us a lot of guidance as well as National Youth Council. And... So that was like the springboard for us. And now we are trying to operate as an independent nonprofit where we go on to, you know, teach youths and, you know, make strides on our own without relying on any other organization. Okay. So it, it is going to be a much tougher journey, but we are we see the value and the merit in it. So hopefully that's something for a long term. So it's sort of just an organization that is able to affect long term impact yeah, in hopefully. Singapore. And it, it's mostly youth oriented, right? Sorry? So for now, it's mostly youth oriented. Com- completely youth oriented. We are a f- by youth for youth organization. Do you see yourself yeah. branching out? I mean, at, at some point, sure. But yeah. you have plans for that for now, at, right now? Or is it more just, okay, this is our target. We work with them first, make sure we get, you know, everything uh, said and then we move on. I think we aren't thinking about moving on from youth. So, I think youth are already a huge population. Oh, yeah. yeah. And but a team of 20 adults, is, is, yeah. is big, yeah. but... I mean, for the number of youth that are yeah. in this country that, that may need support, I guess it, it, it's, it's, I think it's really cool that you've done this whole, I mean, yes, you're interested in math, you've done the whole math Olympiad stuff, uh, but your interest in finance has manifested in a multitude of ways. Uh, one, of course, of which is just you've done these courses, right? So you've explored your own interests, you've gained a lot of knowledge, but very interestingly, you've then created the sort of structures that aim to give back uh, based on your experiences. Uh, with individuals and other youth in Singapore. Uh, and I'm, I'm honestly quite glad that it's something that you are going to continue to be a part of. Even after you go to university, you're sort of laying the stages for the next generation of, of leadership within the organization. Um, I think it's quite, it's all too often that people start something up, right, for university and just ditch it the moment that they get in and run away and never look back. But the fact that you're continuing, I think that says quite a bit about your intentions for the long term. That's all for today's episode of Dear Applicants. Thank you so much for joining us. I hope that you found the content valuable and insightful. If you'd like to learn more about our guests or the topics we discussed, be sure to check out our show notes for links and further resources.